So without further ado, let's just dedicate it to Dr. Michael Beach. Thank you, Larry. I tell you what, it's a great honor to be here today. And I'm, this is our first, our first presentation. And I'm thrilled to be here with Dr. Michael Bruce. He's the lead specialist. You've probably seen him on Dr. Oz or Anderson Cooper or some TV show. And I'm on the other one. You know, once you flip the channel, you can see us both. But today we're going to be talking about sleep. Sleep is something we all saw. We, we sight, we miss it, maybe it's just rebound, no retakes there, right? But sleep is a biological function, you know? Sleep is so important. You would literally die if you do not get your sleep. It's as important as water and food and exercise. So sleep is definitely something we really sought out. Whoops, they told us we had one, but now we have two. We can't get two. <laughs> hey, that even looks like it works. How's everybody doing tonight? All right, who had a really good night's sleep last night? Raise your hand. All right, everybody over here, who had a really good night's sleep? We got two raise people that had a really two, good three. night's sleep. All right, raise your hand if you had not such a good night's sleep last night. All right, all right. Well, these are the people that we're so, talking to today. Exactly. So you notice I raised my hand. Last night our air conditioner went out. Oops. Yeah, on the bottom floor. And at about 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, my French bulldog, who was lying right next to me in bed. Yes, that's right. I do sleep with the dog. Next to me. How many people here sleep with the dog next to them in bed? All right, I'm here to tell you that's perfectly okay. I'm the sleep doctor, and you're allowed to do that, so don't worry about it one bit, okay? Well, that's not what we say. We say they toss and turn and disturb your sleep. <laughs> I know more people, believe it or not, I know more people that sleep with an animal in bed, and if you took that animal away, they would miss them terribly, and they wouldn't be able to fall asleep. Right? It's just whatever you get used to, isn't that right? That's exactly what right. Larry, can we get the first time? So, first thing I want to do is I want to educate everybody here in what is sleep, all right? So for all you folks who are over here, Come on, in. Come, on Come on up. We got lots of spots. There we go. Come on up. So first of all, sleep is actually a biological function, okay? There's two specific systems that we know make you sleep. One is a drive, much like hunger, right? So I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. I eat something. I'm hungry, I'm hungry. Oh, I'll go back. I'm, sorry. I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. I eat something and that hunger dissipates. The same holds true with sleep, right? So I get sleepier and sleepier and sleepier throughout the day, and when I take a nap, that reduces my sleep drop. But when I go to sleep at the right bedtime, then I'm not actually doing something that I need to be doing. There's a second system called your circadian rhythm, or your biological clock, okay? And that can be off. And if, your, if your drive isn't high, and your system isn't right, you have a sleep disorder. Does anybody here, can anybody here name a sleep disorder? Apnea, narcolepsy, what'd you say? Insomnia. You just hit the three big ones. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Next slide, please. One more, hit, hit me one more time. So what most people don't know is there are different stages of sleep. There's what we call light sleep, which is stage one and two. There's deep sleep, which is stages three and four. And there's REM sleep, okay? So... Any, anybody here know what you do during REM sleep? You're going to be my A number one student. You got a good night's sleep last night. You're answering all the I love it. I love it. All right. If I need another assistant, you're going to be my girl. I will. I'll ask you just a second. Okay. Okay, but what does that REM stand for? Rapid yeah. eye movement. Rapid eye movement. You know, because that's the one time at nighttime when your body is dreaming. And yep. restoring, and actually it produces a chemical that you're paralyzed. That's correct. So you know why you're paralyzed during REM sleep? <laughs> so you don't act out your dreams. Yeah. All right, I'm going to tell you about a patient I have who actually does this. So I'm originally from Sandy Springs, Georgia, okay, which we're a fairly big hunting community down there. And this is a gentleman who was a deer hunter, all right, and he was dreaming that he had shot a doe. Now, anybody here that's a hunter knows if you shoot a doe and you don't kill it, you have to go over and you have to slit its throat and crack its neck, right? It's the most humane thing to do. He woke up with his wife's head 
I kid you not, but his wife's head almost broke her He had what's called REM behavior disorder, where he would actually act on his dreams. He wasn't paralyzed during that period of time. It turns out that REM behavior disorder is a precursor to Parkinson's. And when we learned about his REM behavior disorder, we got him to a neurologist very quickly, and we were able to help get him treatment for Parkinson's even before he had sleep. So sleep teaches us many, many things. But we learn that people aren't sleeping well. What we also end up learning is there could be other physical things that are going on. And Debbie's absolutely right. There's a physical restoration and a mental restoration that seems to occur. Can I get the next slide? So what happens when we sleep really? So stage one is that light, I'm falling asleep stage, right? Anybody in here ever feel like they're actually falling? Right? And they wake up and they kind of jerk around. That's called a hypnic jerk. That's not the guy who's lying next to you in the bed. Okay? That's called a hypnic jerk. And that's a very common thing. It usually happens when you're sleep deprived. So one of the things you want to watch out for. Next one, Larry. Stage two actually makes up almost 50% of sleep. And what we think is going on in stage two is setting your body up for that physical restoration. Because what happens next is stages three and four. Now stages three and four are very, very important. Because what happens during stages three and four is that's when your growth hormone is in. That's when all of the repair to your muscles occur. Right? So if you've been out working out, in the garden, walking around, whatever it is you happen to be doing, if you don't get stage three and four sleep, you feel terrible. Right? You physically feel terrible. The last stage, we talked about before, the gentleman knew exactly what it was, REM sleep, or rapid eye movement sleep. That's the mentally restored sleep. So you know how I can tell when somebody isn't getting good REM sleep? I ask them, you ever walk into a room and forget why you're there? How many people have done that? Okay. You ever lose your car keys? Right? You ever go to the store and you can't remember what you're supposed to buy? Yeah, yeah. That's the lack of REM sleep. All right? And that's one of the first things that we talk about when we're in sleep centers is how do we get people more REM sleep and more stage 3 sleep? So what happens when we... Had your full night's sleep, but you really don't think you got a good night's sleep. You never got that REM sleep. And that's exactly right. You either didn't get the REM sleep or you didn't get the stage three, four sleep. Mm. And one of the things that I do, can I get the next slide? This just tells again what's going on. One of the other things we know is during stage three and four sleep, look at this, it revitalizes your immune system. We actually did a study out of, uh, when I was working up in Chicago, and what we learned was is when we were giving people the flu shot, if they didn't have enough stage three and four sleep, they were greater likely to catch the flu. Right? So we know that these stages are vitally important for people's overall physical well-being. Can I get the next one? Did you know that there are more calories burned in REM sleep than in any other stage of sleep? It's because your brain is more active during REM sleep because you're dreaming. You're processing information. We now know that when you get all kinds of information during the day, REM sleep is where you Organize those thoughts for better recall. So if you learn something during the day and you don't get your REM sleep, you're not going to remember it. Sort of like a computer. You download everything you learn that day at nighttime. That's exactly right. Can I get the next slide? So sleeplessness and sleep problems are very, very common, right? Close to 75% of adults frequently have a sleep problem. So it's right there, right? And 50% of people snore. I'm not going to ask everybody in here who snores, because that's just not a fun question to answer. But here's a great, here's a great statistic. Did you know that if you sleep next to a bed partner that snores, you lose one hour of sleep over time? How many people can relate to that statistic? <laughs> so the thing to think about is when you have somebody that's snoring, you got to wonder, could they possibly have something called sleep apnea? Right? So what is sleep apnea? Sleep apnea is a situation where people stop breathing in their sleep. Okay? Generally speaking, we like our patients to breathe. Right? It's a good thing. Boy, it's a tough crowd. Oh my gosh. So generally we like our patients to breathe, and what we want to do is we want to prevent them from stopping breathing at night. There's a lot of different ways to do that. Sometimes it happens with weight loss, sometimes it happens with something called the CPAP machine. Is anybody here familiar with that? So the CPAP machines are actually very, very interesting machines. It's kind of like this. If you were in a room and the walls of the room started to come in, you'd stand up and put your arms up, right? You'd keep the walls from squishing. The same thing is going on here in sleep apnea in people's throats. Is the walls of their throats are beginning to collapse and collapse and collapse. When they get that one point, it cuts off their air completely. 
What a CPAP machine does is puts a little mask on your nose with a hose to a little air compressor. Shoots a thin stream of air just down your throat and hits that area just ever so slightly opens it up. Okay? Doesn't hurt. Doesn't have any side effects. It's effective 99% of the time. It's the only treatment in all of medicine that we know is 99% effective. And you know what? It makes your skin beautiful. Makes everything look good, right? It makes you feel good, so you look good, and Absolutely. your skin is rejuvenated. Yeah, and what happens is you got better circulation, and that's one of the reasons why your skin looks better, right? And what's really good is it stops that person who had sleep apnea from snoring, and then the bed partner gets better night's rest too, and then everybody's happy, right? Oh, can you go back one more? Sorry. So here's something. Here's a pretty interesting statistic. There are 88 different sleep disorders out there. 88. I mean, I didn't know you could do 88 things wrong in your sleep. Exactly. We only mentioned three. We mentioned narcolepsy, sleep apnea, and insomnia. But believe it or not, when you go to a sleep center, they can diagnose you and evaluate you for any one of those 88 things. Go ahead. So here's one of the things that we know. Is you hit it one more time for me. About it. Oh, go back. I'm sorry. One more back. So here's what we know. My graphics aren't popping up. But when you have bad sleep, it leads to bad health. So when you have bad sleep, what do you get? Health problems, weight gain, depression, decreased immune function, increased stress, poor marital satisfaction, high blood pressure, increased pain. Right? But what happens when you get good sleep? When you get good sleep, you have balance. You have weight loss. Happiness, creativity, decreased stress, marital satisfaction, decreased blood pressure, and reduced pain. Great study out of, I think it was the University of Minneapolis, where they took people and they gave them what's called a pain protocol. So they took a big bucket of ice water. So has everybody heard about this ice water, dump it over your head challenge? Okay, well, long before they had that, they had this, this type of thing where they took college kids and they would have them stick both of their feet up to their knees in ice, ice, ice cold water. It's extremely painful, and they would see how long it would take them to yank their feet out. They did this with these kids, they timed it. Then they kept them up for 36 hours. Did you know that they pulled their feet out twice as fast because the pain was twice as much, and they were sleeping well? So anybody out there who suffers from any type of chronic pain, low back pain, diabetic foot pain, whatever that happens to be, if you're sleep deprived, if you have sleep apnea that's undiagnosed, if you're not getting enough good sleep, here's what we know, the pain hurts worse. So that's a good reason to think about getting it. So if you have a choice, we definitely want this slide instead of the other slide. Yeah, exactly. Get your sleep. Exactly. Another thing, my most recent book is called The Sleep Doctor's Diet Plan, Lose Weight Through Better Sleep. Why is that? We now know that sleep deprivation is directly linked to weight gain. So I was doing an interview with Glamour Magazine, and um, I was talking with the woman there, and she said, uh, you know, we're going to give your book to 10 women, and we're going to see what happens. And I said, well, you better weigh them before it happens, because they're all going to lose weight. And she said, Dr. Bruce, seriously, are women really going to lose weight if you're sleeping better? Here's what we found. One woman, the woman who lost the least amount of weight, only lost 6 pounds. One woman lost 15 pounds in 10 weeks just from getting more sleep. She didn't change her diet. She didn't change her exercise at all. She was sleeping five hours a night. She was a nurse. She was sleeping five hours a night. She was a single mom, right? And so she was working two jobs and getting her kids to school and sleeping all the hours at school. And it was a really tough one. We got her just to stay in bed for seven and a half hours. And the weight literally just dropped. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. That is really cool. You know, that sleeping makes you smarter. Great study out of Germany showed that the less sleep deprivation you have, the easier it is to figure out puzzles, the easier it is to come to better conclusions. You know that old saying, it's good to sleep on it before I make a decision? There's actually real data to show that that is true. If you've got a big decision to make, whether it's a healthcare decision or a financial decision or whatever it happens to be, you need to make sure that you have that you're well rested that decision, otherwise you could make the wrong choice. And it prevents those impulse buys or whatever if you have to sleep on it. Absolutely. It really does help. It really does. Sleeping makes you sexier. Yep, that's right, I said it. Sleeping makes you sexier. Here's what we know.
right? Is number one, when you're asleep, you're out of the sun, right? So you don't get the harmful UV rays. But more importantly, we know that as you lose sleep, your blood pressure raises, which means you retain fluid. What does that give you? Puffy eyes. We know that when you're sleep deprived, your circulation goes down, and this delicate skin right underneath your eye, that's where blood cools, and you get raccoon eyes or dark circles under your eyes. We know that as your circulation decreases with sleep deprivation, you get that ashen color. You don't get that beautiful color of skin like what Debbie was talking about, right? So there's no question about it. Sleeping makes you thinner, it makes you smarter, and it makes you sexier. I mean, really, is there anything out there that does all that? I uh, really don't think there is. It also makes you happier. Believe it or not, um, happily married women reported fewer sleep disturbances. Sleep loss was associated with significantly less happiness and more fatigue. And let's face it, when you're tired, you're grumpy, right? My daughter says it to me all the time. She says, Dad, you need more sleep. You're a grumpy fish. That's what she calls me, a grumpy fish, right? Because what happens when you don't get enough sleep, it really has a pretty major effect on you. So now we're going to do a sleep evaluation. Is everybody ready? I want everybody to look at the screen because we're all going to take a test. I know they didn't tell you there was going to be a test today, right? This is a test everybody can take in their head. Don't worry about it. We're going to determine whether or not you've got a sleep problem. All right, you ready? So the first question, men only, what is your shirt collar size? All right, women don't usually have to worry about this, but guys, you know, we have to have our collars so we can, you know, have a tie, a tie, and things like that. Everybody got it in their head? What's your shirt collar size? All right, go ahead. One more. If it's more than 17 and a half inches, you have over an 80% chance of having sleep apnea. It's the largest single physical marker in all of medicine. I could stand outside at the big and tall store all day and tell you who's got apnea. Like that. All day long. That's to do with the size of your neck. Okay, next question. Has anyone ever heard you snore or stop breathing in your sleep? Okay. 50% of people snore, but if somebody's heard you stop breathing or stopping snoring in your sleep for just a moment, and then you and you make one of those kind of sounds afterwards, that's almost a for sure sign of sleep apnea. Yeah, this is something that's pretty serious. Um, undiagnosed sleep apnea leads to high blood pressure, heart attack, stroke, even death. So what he was doing was gasping for air. So you actually literally could die every time you stop breathing with that gasping for air. Yep. So does anybody here remember uh, Reggie White? Right, the football player? That's one of the things that he died from, was sleep apnea, undiagnosed sleep apnea. Has anyone, oh, okay, we did this one already. Let's do the next one. Raise your hand if you get less than eight hours of sleep a night. Raise your hand. Keep them up, keep them up, keep them up. All right, Raise, keep your hand raised if you get less than seven and a half. Less than seven, less than six and a half, less than six, less than five and a half hours. Okay, honey, you can go take it out. This one. This one too, all right? The data would show, the data would show that if you get less than five and a half hours of sleep a night, or you get more than 10 hours of sleep in a night, you have a double mortality. Four hours is not good. We'll talk after. You see, you're not performing to your highest capabilities if you don't get the rest that you need. The statistics shows it over and over and over again. It's seven and a half to eight hours that's correct. that you must get every night. And that's every night. So if you have a routine and you break your routine, you've got to make it up. It's a sleep debt, like a credit card. You just charge the hours worth of sleep that is a debt. It's a sleep debt. And people have to remember that everybody's sleep need to be different. So I've been a six and a half to seven hour guy my whole life, but my wife needs nine hours, and she always has. So we work our schedules appropriately so that way I get up with the kids in the morning and I'll help uh, you know, out in the evenings, whereas she gets up at her time and she goes to bed at her time. And it makes, trust me, for a much better marriage, but it also makes for her not to be so tired. Right that is so nice. <laughs> You're just a nice guy. That's I'm awesome. trying. I'm trying. Did you know that people who drive People who drive a vehicle after being away for more than 19 hours, if we stuck them in a driving simulator, they would do as well as somebody that was legally drunk. Can you believe that? Sleep deprivation is no joke, all right? 
Um, I was working with the, I, again, I'm from Sandy Springs, Georgia, and I was working with the police department out there early in my career, and we used to go to accident scenes to try to determine if somebody fell asleep while they were driving or if they were drinking while they were driving. You know how you tell the difference? No skid marks. They never hit the brakes when they're asleep. They just drive right into the tree, right into the bar, right into the wall. Whereas when people are drunk driving, they hit the That's how you can tell them. And more people are dying from driving accidents that have to do with sleep deprivation and all behind the wheel, almost more than without the wheel. Because it's been such a tremendous problem. And causing great fatalities. Tremendous. Tremendous. How many nights per week do you have problems falling asleep or staying asleep? How many people have problems one night per week? No. Two nights per week? Okay. Three nights per week? Four? Five? Okay, so here's what we know. The true definition of insomnia is if you have a hard problem with either of you. If you have a hard time falling asleep or staying asleep, more than three nights per week, or you wake up more than three times for more than 30 minutes. Okay? That could be a sign of what we call insomnia. There's a lot of different things you can do about it, not just take a pill about it. Okay? So, I do a lot of work with the military. Alright? Here's the guy who was driving the truck, and he fell asleep. Here's the roof of the truck, and here is a bomb. No joke. Okay? He fell asleep, drove right through the wing of the aircraft, and ripped the entire roof off of his truck because he was asleep. Now, the good news was... That's a fuel tank. There's no fly, fins on it. You know, but at the same time, I mean, it just kind of proves the point, right? Some bad stuff can happen when you're sleeping. Next slide. Did you know that there are actually two different climates in your bedroom? There's outside of the covers, and there's under the covers, right? So, what do you want the best temperature for sleep to be? You want it to be somewhere between about 68 and 72 degrees. You want to keep it as cool as you can. Now, granted, we live in Arizona. If I can cool my house to 72 degrees, well, I'd probably be broke, right? Because it just costs too much money. So what you want to do is you want to be about 20, 25 degrees off of the daily high in order to be able to allow your body to rest well. The body sleep better than the pool. And there's a lot of different things you need to think about when you think about temperature, right? So, what kind of mattress do you have? What kind of sheets do you have? What kind of comforter do you have? What kind of pajamas are you wearing? All of these things can have a pretty major effect on overall temperature and sleep. That's definitely something you want to think about. For example, I have patients who are going through menopause, and one of the first things they tell me is, I gotta have moisture wicking sheets. I gotta, exactly. They say, I can't sleep on memory foam, I have to sleep on, you know, springs. I can't do this, I can't do that. There's lots of different things out there that you need to think about when you think about sleep. If you have the right equipment, you will sleep better. What does that mean? It means the right mattress, it means the right pillow, it means the right sheets, that means the right pajamas. If you have the right equipment, you will sleep better. That's something to keep in mind when you're thinking about how is my overall sleep? What is my environment like? And what is the equipment that I have that helps me sleep? So keep that. Keep that in mind. Cool, quiet, dark, and a comfy mattress. Alright, here's a good question. How many times do you hit the snooze button? Alright, first of all, who in here hits the snooze button? Raise your hand. Uh-oh. You're the one who doesn't, doesn't sleep well, right? I have How many times do you hit the snooze button? One. One? That's pretty good. So, the average snooze button is between seven and nine minutes long, and your body physically can't get into a deep stage of sleep. So I'd rather you set your alarm for the last possible moment when you have to wake up, because otherwise all you're doing is giving yourself light, junky sleep. Okay? Snooze button's worst invention for sleep ever. Are you a light sleeper disturbed by your bed partner? We already talked a little bit about having animals in the bed. And I'm not just talking about your husband, ladies. Okay? I'm talking about cats, dogs, grandchildren, children, what have you. And I'll tell you, in my bed, I've got a French bulldog, a chihuahua, a cat, my wife, and occasionally a child. 
life. So we have a California king. Yes, that's true. We do. And we have a super big bed, and we've got the dogs that are in their spots, and the cat in Hawaii. And we've got it all kind of figured out, but there are a lot of people who don't. Thanks, Bob. So here's another one. So this gentleman was driving a forklift, fell asleep. Here's another bomb. Wow. Right? This is not what we want to see, folks. We want people awake, being saved, right, and knowing kind of what some of those consequences could be. Has anyone here ever come to sleep in the wheel? It does happen. Absolutely. Nose off? No. <laughs> Scary. Yeah, absolutely. Especially driving to Tucson. So, what we want you to do is sleep your way to health and happiness. I'm going to give you five simple steps to help you sleep, and then we're going to open it up for questions, okay? All right, there you go. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. I was going to talk about vitamins. So, how many people in here take vitamins or supplements? All right, good. So, let's talk about that for a second. Turns out that the B vitamins are some of the most important vitamins for sleep. Okay? Specifically, B3 actually helps increase the effectiveness of tryptophan. So, tryptophan is a neurochemical that actually helps you get into all of sleep. So, B3 is a good one. B6 is required for creating serotonin. So, okay? Step number one, stick to one schedule. The worst thing you can do is go to bed at various times and wake up at various times. Get up every day at the same time. Because that's how your brain knows when it's supposed to be awake when it's supposed to be asleep. Number two, stop caffeine by 2 p.m. Notice I didn't say stop caffeine. If I don't get a cup of coffee every morning, I am a grumpy fish. Right? I'm fully willing to admit that. But caffeine's a good thing, but also at the right time. Most people don't know caffeine has an outside of between 8 and 10 hours. So if you're planning on going to bed at 10, you need to stop by 2. Okay? <laughs> Limit alcohol to 3 hours before bedtime. Notice I didn't say you can't have a glass of wine. I like wine, right? Wine's a good thing, right? But it's not so good for sleep when you have it too close to bedtime. You want to have a glass of wine with dinner or even two, your doctor says it's okay and it doesn't interact with any of your medications. I'm fine with it. But it takes the average human body one hour per alcoholic beverage throughout the rest of it. While wine makes you feel sleepy, it actually keeps you out of the deeper stages of sleep. And it's a diuretic, so it makes you wake up from night after bath. So there's two reasons why alcohol is not so great for sleep. So it's okay to have a glass of wine or two, to be aware when you stop having Exercise. The single easiest way to improve the quality of your sleep is daily exercise. Now I'm not talking about having to go out on a marathon, but if you are walking for 10 to 15 minutes every day, there is a lot of data to show that it will actually help with your sleep. Or even like stretches, even yoga. Yoga is great. It doesn't have to be real physical. Exactly. Just mentally you need that exercising. No question. And my last one, get 15 minutes of sunlight every single morning. The sun's a good thing. You know, we've been talk talking about for years, oh, stay out of the sunlight, put on sunscreen, all these things. Now we've got a world full of vitamin D deficiency, right, number one. But number two, sun comes in, hits the optic nerve, bounces around and resets your circadian clock. The best thing you can do when you wake up at your consistent morning wake up time is go outside, have your cup of coffee while you're sitting outside. Go to walk to the mailbox, get your newspaper, right? Take the dog for a walk in the morning. Whatever it is you can do to get 15 minutes of sunlight in through the optic nerve and reset that clock. If you follow these five simple steps, I can almost guarantee you you're going to improve the quality. Improve the quality of your sleep and the more time that you spend in that bed. I mean, if this was a formula that the doctor wrote for you, I think you would go and redeem it, right? So if you get more sleep, it'll definitely be healthier. It'll improve your immune system. It'll improve your mood. And it'll make you a lot healthier and happier. And your spouse will be a lot happier, too. Maybe you'll sleep in the same bed. Who knows? And your memory will improve. All of your disease will improve. Sleep hits every organ system in every single disease state. So the, one of the easiest ways you can do to improve any medical 